Namaste and good morning everybody. It's my pleasure and our pleasure to welcome all of you for this Indian Medical Heritage Day which we celebrate in memory of late His Highness Shri Kantha Datta Narasimha Vadiyar. And uh, we always look forward to these day, this day because we will have our beloved Her Highness uh, Pramoda Devi Maharani, Pramoda Devi Vadiyar with us and she is a big well-wisher of TDU. Along with her today we have our chief guest, uh, guest of honor, Professor Spenta Vadia, who is founder director of ICTS, International Center for Theoretical Sciences and Infosys Homi Baba Chair Professor. So we will listen to him today. Uh, along with uh, both of them, we have Mr. K Ricky Cage, whom I don't need to introduce, I think. He just completed his hat-trick of Grammy Awards for his uh, album Divine Tribe, uh, Divine Tri Tides uh, recently. And it's a very good album. I heard the music and it's really, really nice. Then Sri Nawaz, Nawaz Ahmed, who is the business, business magnet and philanthropist and friend of TDU. Then I welcome Captain, uh, Captain Rajesh Jaisimha, uh, welcome sir, uh, Chief Vigilance Officer of Social Welfare Department, uh, Karnataka. And uh, uh, Mr. S.C. Shivramu, former chairman of Karnataka, prestigious Karnataka Bar Council. Mr. P. N. Ganesh, Namaste sir, uh, Inspector of Police and he is the first and the only person who has uh, climbed uh, Mount Everest. He just not did not climb Mount Everest, from, he is the first person from Karnataka. He just not did that, he took flags of all countries of the world there and uh, also for the religious harmony he carried three texts, holy texts there and he celebrated that day and his uh, achieving that victory in uh, that way for global, uh, uh, globally, for global significance. And uh, we also have, uh, uh, so we, have, we will be beginning with the welcome address uh, from our Vice Chancellor. Before that, I hand it over to Vinay to take it forward. Thank you, Ashwini. Elarigu Namaskara. We will begin this auspicious occasion with music. I invite Ms. Nandita Menon on stage for the invocation song. Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samak Prabha Nirvignam Kurumi Deva Sarvakai Shu Sarvada Satmai Devi Saraswati Veda Brahma Sati Bharati Mangala Manjula Basha Vilasini Vina Vadini Kalavati Hamsavahini Vetya Dharini Hamsavahini Vetya Dharini Veda Rupini Devi Bhagavati Veda Rupini Devi Bhagavati Satmai Devi Saraswati Satmai Devi Saraswati A beautiful melody indeed. Thanks, Nandita. Now I request our Vice Chancellor, Sri Darshan Shankar, to deliver the welcome address. Good 
Good morning, everybody. I welcome, as directed by Vinay, all of you, and my special welcome to Her Highness Sri Pramoda Devi Vadiyar. We look forward to this particular day. Uh, every year, uh, several years ago, when I first met Her Highness and sought uh, her help for the growth and well-being of this university, she readily agreed and mentioned that uh, her husband uh, was, you know, deeply sort of uh, interested and concerned about the, uh, amongst his many interests, among, uh, was deeply interested in the contemporary relevance of India's uh, knowledge traditions. And so she supported at that time us, uh, the university, with an endowment for the library. And uh, so the, our library is named after uh, her late husband. Our library is called uh, Shri Kantadatta Narsimha Raja Vadiyar Library. And uh, she promised, rather we made her promise that every year we would uh, celebrate this particular date in a befitting uh, manner. And so this year, like other years, she has graced the occasion. We thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, special welcome, of course, to Spenta Wadia, uh, who will be talking to us on a subject that uh, uh, some of us may understand, but uh, some of us it may it may go above like my own. It may go above the head. I mean, Spenta is the as introduced as the founding founding director of uh, a TFR Institute for Theoretical Sciences and uh, his research uh, contribution is in areas uh, like high energy physics I don't know what that means string theory even more difficult, black hole physics, you know, that's really at the frontiers of our understanding uh, of, you know, what's happening out there in space. Statistical mechanics and complex systems. Of course, I'm sure he's not going to, you know, talk, he'll, he'll talk about something that at least we'll get some idea. Uh, he's going to be talking about time. I have been seeing Spenta uh, since the age of 15, you'll be surprised. Uh, the reason is that uh, we happen to be in the same school, but he was elder to me. And although you know, I didn't sort of know him, uh, he was noticeable, you know. So I knew the name Spenta Vadia right from school. And it also so happened that in St. Xavier's College, uh, I was one year behind him. Uh, so I, I, I noticed him again in St. Xavier's College. I knew him, he didn't know me, you know, I was junior to him. But he was, uh, he had a aura about him, you know, in school or, I mean, an aura of knowledge, etc. around him, I don't know what. But he was 
So I've known him for a long, I have known him for a long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was in St. Xavier's College, he was in IIT Kanpur, he was in the uh, City University uh, College of New York or Un City University of New York and Chicago University and has received a lot of uh, recognition I think not only in terms of uh, awards that he may have received uh, like the 2004 Physics Prize of the World Academy of Science and the 1995 Prize uh, of uh, Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics but he is, you know, he is recognized in his own field, uh, you know. Yeah. There would be few people, I think, uh, all over the world uh, who would be uh, knowledgeable in the areas that I mentioned, uh, you know, in which he, he works. So he's, he's anyway recognized for his work irrespective of those uh, prizes. So we will look forward to hearing his uh, reflections, narration and uh, I hope that, I am sure that all of you will, will, will enjoy it and get some, some idea you know, about how time has uh, evolved from the perspective of uh, physics. So I think, uh, welcome uh, to the special guests who have already been mentioned by Ashwini and welcome to all of you. Uh, please enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before I proceed, uh, just a gentle reminder, please keep your mobile phones on mute in silent mode. This will help us a lot. We are honored and delighted that Her Highness Srimati Pramoda Devi Vadiyar, Royal Family of Mysore, has graced us with her presence. I request Her Highness, to please address the audience with some brief remarks. Good morning. At the outset, uh, I must say that it's always a pleasure to visit this campus since I associated myself with this campus about seven years ago. I've never missed a chance to come here and I think for the last seven years it's become a ritual to kind of be present on this particular day either on 19th or on 20th of February. And there is a significance to that because my husband was born, I mean, he shares two dates as his birthday because he was born midnight on the 19th. And uh, as per our Hindu calendar, it falls on 19th and as per English calendar, it falls on the 20th. So <laughs> Vice Chancellor has been very uh, very, uh, you know, uh, I can't find the word, very, very affectionately and without uh, this thing he remembers to observe this uh, every year. Having said that, I'm very happy to be here, to be part of this. Uh, Professor Vice Chancellor, Professor Spentavadia, Mrs. Spentavadia, and all the distinguished invitees, the students. I'm as, as eager as you all are to listen to Professor Spentavadia, so it won't take much time. And whatever little way I can help this uh, university, I'm always uh, there. And uh, I really appreciate the hard work and the dedication uh, Vice Chancellor Ashan Shankar has uh, been through. You know, his dedication is something which is unmatchable. 
So having said that, I I really am happy to be here and then I wish every one of you all the best and then my best wishes to the university. I hope the university grows from here to, you know, whatever goal they have. And then, I'm, you know, I hope I'll be seeing you next year also. <laughs> so thank you all. And then I'll, I'll stop here because I'm keen to know something which I don't know much about. So I hope I'll gain some knowledge. I just, uh, I was presented with a book called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. I was just telling him that, you know, our generation had very little option. We had to opt for science or uh, arts. And we had, I you know, when we were growing up, it was very conservative. You know, we had a sheltered life. So he was just telling uh, his wife that whatever we studied and learned during our uh, school days and college days has really not helped us in any way. So Professor Spinter told me, no, 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 don't, it's not like that. There's always uh, some use of whatever you studied. And then he handed me a book for which I thank him. And I thank you. For, I actually marrowed uh, Professor Vice Chancellor's copy. <laughs> I hope uh, you know, he'll get another copy. So I'm going to take that copy and enjoy reading that book. Thank you. Thank you, Your Highness. I now invite uh, Dr. Professor Spenta Vadia on stage to give his talk on the journey of time. Welcome, sir. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember. Somebody used to say this before every talk. His name was Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> so, uh, I am very uh, sort of uh, delighted and the I don't know how to say it, but uh, so, uh, so thankful to be invited to give a talk. Uh, at this university on this uh, occasion. Uh, so, uh, what do I do now? No, no, I, I think, uh, okay. All right. Is this visible well at the back? Uh, is it illuminated properly? Okay, fine. All right, so I, I am uh, from the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of the Data Institute of Fundamental Research. That's the campus. It's just 15 minutes away from here. So sometime, please do visit, actually. Uh, <coughs> so I am, uh, I am going to talk about the journey of time because Darshan called me. And I, didn't know, I don't know why he called me, but he called me and asked me to talk about quantum time and stuff like that. So, well, that's, uh, it's complicated. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, just talk of something historical of how, how uh, our species uh, arrived at the concept of time. And uh, in this story of time is also the story of the development of uh, physics and also some very important uh, impact on uh, our society and technology uh, as you will see. Okay, so our awareness of day and night is obvious, right? We all know that uh <coughs> because the sun appears and disappears daily. This is related to the spinning of the earth on its axis and uh, I think there is a pointer here. I hope I will do it right. 
this one. Yeah. Okay. No, but this is not good for me. Okay. Uh, the point is, I'll, 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 I'll just do it this way. So th this, this is a, this is a picture of our Earth, and uh, you know, it's spinning around its axis. And of course, I mean, it, it took, uh, uh, you know, thousands of years actually to arrive at an explanation of this very elementary fact that all cultures, except those, as Lena pointed out living in Sweden, for example, will not see the sunrise <laughs> every day. And uh, so there is some calibration of, uh, you know, the uh, notion of time developing. And uh, an explanation that came later on is because the Earth is spinning around its axis, right? We all know that from high school, right? <coughs> but before any one of us actually, you know, cognizant of this type of concept. Uh, it was already hardwired into our genes and uh, as you know, this is a biology place uh, that uh, there is secretion of melatonin, for example, towards the evening that puts us nicely to sleep. And such circadian rhythms are present in, you know, all of uh, life, animals, plants and other living matter. All right. Now, then comes a longer interval of time. Just imagine yourself about 10, 20,000 years ago of our species. You know, you can, they didn't know that the earth goes around the sun or anything like that, right? So how, how did we sort of uh, become aware of the fact that what we call today the time interval called the year? So <coughs> this was... Uh, uh, through the seasons, okay, and their manifestation in terms of hot and cold weather, and the appearance of fruits and flowers, migratory patterns of birds and animals. And when agriculture came about, it was a time for sowing seeds and a time for harvest. So there was this notion, intuitive notion developing about a certain periodicity of nature, actually. Okay, so I have just some, uh, some uh, pictures over here about, uh, you know, Many, many, many centuries later, we understood the origin of the seasons uh, in terms of, uh, you know, simple astronomy. And, 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 very importantly, and this is crucial actually, and more crucial than you might think, the tilt of the axis of the Earth, actually, the tilt is around 23 degrees. And that tilt, if it was 24, it was 22, things would be very, very different. And in fact, <coughs> Yeah, this, this is a, every, every slide over here is a very long story. So I just want to uh, enthuse you into this question, ki why the tilt of 23 degrees is so important actually. And maybe you can have a little seminar on that from some expert, etc. <coughs> this is number 23. Okay, now let me go ahead. So this is uh, some uh, understanding of the development of time. So we are looking for periodic motion, peri I'm sorry, periodic occurrences in nature. Okay. So the most uh, obvious uh, periodic uh, occurrence, it's all from astronomy in the beginning actually, so it's uh, the phases of the moon, right? The waxing and waning of <coughs> the faces of the moon, you know, it looks like a face of a person, right? And the rise and ebb of tides, which is observed, uh, due to its orbit around the Earth, became a natural timekeeper. You see, we are looking for timekeepers. We are looking for phenomenon in the world which are almost periodic in some sense. I, I am uh, running a bit ahead of myself, but uh, early in our history, our sensory perception of the motion of the Earth uh, <coughs> in the solar system and the visible periodicity of the phases of the Moon, these were the two things that uh, started uh, the cognizance of time. So the notion of time, in summary, grew out of the almost periodic cycles of the natural world and that fact has continued into the modern world and I will explain this last part actually, it's quite amazing. Uh, actually in preparing this talk I learnt a lot myself, 
I didn't know much about all these things, frankly. You'll see the stuff I know about, I will start talking a bit later. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me. Okay, so, <coughs> so uh, more sophisticated timekeeping devices emerged which were based on astronomy. It's because that's the most obvious thing you look. And uh, one imperative, and this is a very important point actually, came out of uh, the uh, requirements of navigation at sea. How do you know where you are? Okay. I won't give the answer in detail again. It's a very nice question to ask and try to find out. Because people did find this out. So as the seasons change, a movement of stars, you know, a group of stars called constellations, which have all these in incredible names in all mythology, start moving around. And this, of course, is due to the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, you know. So, people started using the constellations and their progression across the night sky as a way of keeping time. And here comes a very important, something which I took away from this very beautiful book by James Vincent, uh, which is a very recent book. So the synchronization of celestial and terrestrial changes naturally suggests a causal relationship between them and so observing the motion of constellations and planets became a way of explaining and predicting events on Earth. Amazing. This is pretty problematic actually. <laughs> but, uh, but this is what happened actually. Okay, so fine, let's go on. So, However, celestial timekeeping has inaccuracies built into it because celestial motions are never perfectly periodic actually. So, you know, you might think that the Earth goes around the Sun and it's a perfectly periodic motion, uh, which is elliptic. But don't forget there's a moon there. That's a third body. There's Jupiter there, a big planet. There are meteorites. So they disturb this system quite a bit actually. But not too much. But they disturb it so that it's not such a great timekeeper. You know, this periodicity is in some sense uh, dented by the presence of other bodies. For example, the length of the year measured between equinoxes, okay? Between the uh, <coughs> equinoxes is when the sun is directly overhead, overhead your uh, longitude, <coughs> is 365.2422. Now you might think this is a very small number, 0.2422, so what? But think about it. Over 500 years, if you just do a simple multiplication, this becomes 121.1 days. So this small inaccuracy of uh, the measure of the year in terms of equinoxes, which is an astronomical thing, uh, implies a very big change in a few centuries. And similarly, the average length of the lunar month is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and 2.8 seconds. This is all available uh, in various sources on, on the internet, actually. I mean, this is, uh, you don't need a big library today to arrive at all these simple things. Okay, so now here also, therefore, the lunar month is not very, uh, uh, you know, it, it is not such a good timekeeper basically. Okay, so then what happened? Then people started thinking about timekeeping devices which are terrestrial on Earth, which do not rely on the motion of the stars and planets and constellations, etc. So societies developed various terrestrial timekeeping devices like the water clock, uh, which, is, uh, which is over here. This one, this one also. <coughs> the sand glass, which is this one. We all know that. Or even the incense clock, actually, which is uh, the time that was measured by means of a powdered incense burnt along a pre-measured path. This is Middle Eastern. So people started developing all types of devices, you know, engineering, craftsmanship, 
in order to measure time. Okay. On Earth. But none of these devices are very good uh, timekeepers. For example, I mean, a water clock, ingenious water clocks were invented uh, in various uh, cultures and civilizations. Uh, a water clock uh, is not accurate because uh, temperature changes imply that the water becomes more viscous if it is colder, no? So the clock is not a good timekeeper then. And of course, in a very cold climate in winter, it, the water freezes. So you have to have elaborate ways of keeping the temperature right actually. So not very convenient, not very transportable, not very, uh, uh, you can't take it from place to place. All right. So what's the next step? So now comes the big breakthrough, okay? So sorry, uh, yeah. So the so-called oscillator and escapement mechanism, which is one of the great inventions of mechanical engineering, uh, <coughs> creates a regular periodic beat of timekeeping and this was developed uh, originally in countries like China and the Middle East. Uh, but towards the end of the 13th century, European craftsmen, you see I want to emphasize the importance of craftsmen, people who do work with their hands, refined this mechanism to create the first mechanical escapement clock. This is the one. So this is the one that you use all the time in uh, whichever way you power a clock by a pendulum or by a spring. So this is the escapement, you know. So th this moves and this is click, 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 click. You can actually look at it in more detail and enjoy how the elementary clock works actually. Now, <coughs> And so, in various cities of Europe, uh, they put up these huge mechanical clocks. And this is the one which we have seen uh, in the city of Rouen in Normandy. Uh, it's amazing that various of these European cities, and maybe elsewhere, which we haven't been, uh, had these big clocks. Now why? What, what was the implication of this? And this is the point I want to really get to. So the mechanical clock propelled a new conception of time into the public consciousness, okay? Transforming it from a constant flow embodied in steady emissions of like water, sand, mercury to a quantified count. Divisible, discrete and measurable. So this last word is very important actually. And as with the monastic bells, monastic bells in monasteries of Europe or monasteries elsewhere in the world. Uh, public clocks organized citizens into a cohesive unit, turning what had previously been private lives okay, into communal tides that rose, worked and retired at the same time. Everybody gets up more or less at the same time, goes to work, has lunch, dinner and retires, right? So this this uh, organization of uh, human life, of society, actually comes from the invention of the mechanical clock. One of the important aspects. There's nothing I'm saying is absolute or the only thing, but one of the important things. So the clock is not merely a means of keeping track of the hours, but uh, but synchronizing the lives of men, I think this author should have been more gender sensitive. Uh, I don't like that because this is a very recent book. Uh, so this is the point actually. So people invented these uh, clocks, the engineers, and uh, it had a massive impact on the way society is organized. But there is more to it and this is the point I want to also emphasize that uh, this is of course uh, the, uh, the, f the final Im great mechanical clock which was uh, based on an idea of Galileo Galilei uh, in the 17th century and was made by Christian Huygens and this is the pen pendulum clock and these are of course two very very great and famous physicists also. Okay, 
So this just for your information. And now <coughs> I want to make a rather important point actually. Uh, the clock which is a machine became a symbol of a new way of conceiving the universe. Why? Here is where the so-called mechanical philosophers came in. The mechanical the philosophers or natural philosophers who philosophize about the way the world works. But they were close to craftsmen. They were close to people who were doing things with their hands. And this is I think very important for us to understand in India also. So they reasoned that if clockwork was able to capture the movement of the stars and bring an elaborate automata to life, who was to say that the natural world did not operate under a similar logic? If nature worked like a machine, then it must rely on observable cause and effect. This is amazing. I mean, I before preparing for this lecture, I sort of more or less knew you know, in the back of your mind that you know this might be true, but uh, I mean, I'm just I was just amazed that arriving at this uh, object, this invention, did so much. <coughs> and uh, see, you see, the main point is the following. Actually, you want to decouple life on Earth from the stars and the planets because you have seen something, you know made on earth by people on earth that seems to be doing the same job, keeping time. And Galileo Galilei, more than any of his contemporaries, crystallized the integration of experiment and theory and laid the foundation of the scientific method. And he died in 1642. This is the same year his successor, Isaac Newton, was born. Okay, so this, this is a sort of a brief history of uh, how the idea of time arose in uh, human civilization and how in a sense it's also a story of the development of science, scientific method and the coming together of natural philosophy and engineering to give rise to the scientific method. Okay, so now uh, just before I go on to something else about time, which will be a bit surprising, uh, I just wanted to make the point that after the pendulum clock, I mean, which uh, was used almost till the middle of the, or the early 20th century, we came up with new timekeepers. The so you have many of you must be wearing the quartz, quartz watch, right? So. So I will not explain the physics behind the quartz watch, but just uh, the fact that uh, the uh, the uh, advent of quantum mechanics and special relativity actually gives rise to very very accurate uh, timekeeping, and one of them is the quartz crystal uh, clock watch. And however, the most accurate timekeeper is. Uh, the cesium atom and uh, I uh, just wanted to say that the, 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 the unit of second is the duration of 919263 periods of the radiation that comes out of the uh, what are called two hyperfine levels of the cesium atom. I, I don't want to explain this in great detail but this is an astounding fact actually that uh, our search for looking for periodicity in the world to keep time came from just observing day and night and uh, in the 20th century we arrived at this type of accuracy. What is this? Oh. Okay. So basically the point I'm making is that uh, if you have the atom of cesium in quantum mechanics, uh, all atoms have energy levels and there's a transition from one energy level to another and this transition is the one that uh, leads to an extremely accurate timekeeping and for example, the, the, national, uh, the International Timekeeping Bureau uses this and uh, a lot of the military in the United States 
essentially are timed by this device. Okay, so that's uh, so that's the end of uh, very very uh, very uh, what shall I say sensitive timekeeping over several thousand years. Okay, this is the history part. Now, now let's uh, do something which. Uh, so the, now the level of the talk will go a little bit higher, okay? But in the beginning, we will talk of things we all know from high school. But uh, why am I talking about Newtonian frame of physics and the law of universal gravitation? Why? Okay, let, let's go on, actually. All right, so this, this slide... Uh, so you don't have to read these slides very much because uh, I just want to say that uh, in his very famous work, Principia Mathematica in 1687, Newton formulated the laws of motion in terms of the flow of time. You see, the, it, this, this is a very big breakthrough in the history of science that you want to sort of uh, describe the motion of a falling object. I don't want to throw this down, it will break. Uh, you, 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 you say that, okay, this position is sort of, you know, described by three numbers because we are in three dimensions, right? You need three numbers. And how those three numbers change in time is the framework to describe the laws of mechanics. Then, of course, a lot of math had been developed by Newton in order to be able to give some uh, equations, etc. I don't want to discuss those equations. The only thing in this slide, which is a takeaway for you, is that time is absolute and the same for all observers. So this is the point. We all synchronize our clocks, right? I mean, your friend who is uh, taking a flight and, uh, you know, our time and his time or her time are all synchronized, right? It's the same time. That uh, that is uh, something we are so we take for granted, right? So there is something absolute about time. Now this is a slide which will become important later on because it is the failure of this law that changes the notion of time as we go on in physics. Okay, now just wait. So this is the famous law of gravitation of Newton. Now you must have studied it also. In your, <laughs> in your school <laughs> and it is very useful, don't forget that. <laughs> so this is the Newton's law of gravity and uh, Newton's law of gravity assumes the following important thing that if you take two masses like, uh, you know, suppose I have two heavy balls with me and if I change one here, this will immediately get affected, instantaneously get affected. Okay, so this was the flaw. And Newton was aware of this, and this is an amazing quote from the Principia Mathematica, which says that that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else, you see, by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another, means interaction, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophic matters a competent faculty of thinking could ever fall into it. And then he says that, let me just continue, this, this is independent of any talk or profound statement, that I have not yet been able to discover the cause of these properties of gravity from phenomena and I feign no hypothesis. It is enough that gravity does really exist and acts according to the laws I have explained and that it abundantly serves to account for all the motions of celestial bodies. No matter, I don't understand these equations, but they do the right job. But they have one problem and that is this. And this was the real problem Einstein solved. Precisely this point actually. Newton was aware of it. It's quite amazing. Okay. Let me go ahead. So now let's move to another big chapter in the history of science. I don't see history of physics, you know, because it's history of science. You know, this is electromagnetism, electromagnetic waves, constancy or the speed of light. Now what does this all mean? So what it all means is the following. Just a few takeaways from this slide. So <coughs> this is the picture of uh, James Clerk Maxwell. Uh, 
one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century and uh, he unified what we call electricity, magnetism, optics, all which were different subjects. Uh, Maxwell unified all of them uh, by inventing a brilliant set of equations uh, which are called Maxwell's equations and one of the most important predictions of those equations was the fact that these waves, light waves, move at this speed. Okay? This is called the speed of light. Now why is this so important? So the next slide tells you that uh, what I told you in the previous slide is experimentally verified. So I'm very keen on telling you that theories do theory but it's vindicated by experiments actually. So the Maxwell's equation were vindicated experimentally by the discovery of X-rays and microwaves. We all use them all the time, right? X-rays, microwaves, this revolutionized medicine, this uh, revolutionized communications technology, I mean, just amazing. They're all consequences and verifications of Maxwell's theory. Now, why do I need this for our talk here? I need it for the following reason. So, now we enter <coughs> that part of the talk in which time is really doomed actually. The, 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 the concept of time is on a shaky ground and I'll explain to you why. It is on a shaky, shaky ground because, because of the constancy of the speed of light. Now what does that mean? It means the following. That you know when we for example on a highway are passing cars, right? or in the opposite lane or in the same lane, you see there is a velocity difference, right? I mean, you see that uh, the person, if you, if you are looking at a very fast train uh, passing each other, that train to you will appear as going very fast, right? And if, the tra if there is another train on a, on a track next to you, also traveling with a slightly different speed, you will feel that that train is moving slower. Right? So this is the fact that uh, the velocities or the speeds add, right? Now, I'm going to tell you something which is very not intuitive. That this doesn't happen for light. That if, you, if somebody flashes a torch in this train and in the train that is coming this side and you measure the speed of light, it is the same for both. This is the big counterintuitive implication of Maxwell's theory that light does not obey the same velocity addition that we are used to in our daily lives actually. However, if you travel nearly to the speed of light, then you'll see the difference. And this is what this slide tells you. I mean, uh, this is a, <coughs> I'll just explain very quickly. So this is the foundation of the special theory of relativity uh, which, which led to the fact that time and space actually mix up. That there is no time by itself, there is no space by itself, but they just mix up. Why? So this is the point. So let's imagine uh, somebody in a spaceship, okay? And that person has a device, you know, uh, some laser beam which is shot up, there's a mirror and record it again, okay? So, you know, you're just looking at this type of time interval between two events. Emission, absorption, right? Now, <coughs> there is some person on Earth who is looking at that spaceship. What will she actually observe? She will observe something like this. Okay, observe something like this, right? Because light has to now travel a longer distance, right? Now the key point is that this speed over here and the speed over here of light is the same. That leads to a very simple equation which tells you that if the unit of time here is delta t, let's say one second or something, then for this person the unit changes by this very famous factor 1 minus v square upon c square where v is the speed of this spaceship. So if V is very near C, this time gets very elongated, right? So what is one second for the spaceship observer is can be days and hours actually for this observer. So this is all a consequence of the fact that uh, the speed of light is the same whichever way 
you are moving towards it or away from it. This is a, a very ma a main takeaway in this talk and this is the foundation of the special theory of relativity. Okay? All right. So now, <coughs> so basically the point is that space and time have to adjust themselves in some crazy way, uh, which is not so crazy, actually it's very linear, uh, to accommodate this important principle about the speed of light. Okay? Now, let's go. So, just a couple of more little things actually, if, uh, you know, uh, this is the picture of uh, Hermann Mirkowski. He was uh, Einstein's teacher actually and he understood the, uh, the deep geometric significance of Einstein's theory of special relativity which is based on a few things I said. Uh, <coughs> and he basically is a famous quote by Minkowski that uh, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. And th this is uh, amazing actually. And this is experimentally verified. Okay. Eventually, as the 20th century progressed, uh, elementary particle physicists uh, verified all of these statements in high energy collisions at uh, laboratories like CERN and SLAC and stuff like that. Actually, So, okay, I mean, this... Uh, uh, for those of you who know a little bit of geometry, in uh, Euclid's geometry, this is the so-called triangle theorem, right? dx square plus dx4 square is equal to ds square. I'm not saying Pythagoras theorem, but Pythagoras has nothing to do with that theorem. And this was enounced by the Indian mathematician Baudhanya, actually. Okay? So, this is, uh, this is what you call Euclidean space, ordinary things that you are familiar with. Minkowski basically said, that you have to change the sign over here. So this is a geometric way of formulating the special theory of relativity. It's not terribly important for the rest of the talk. Maybe it is, as I will see. I mean, just sorry. The fact that geometry now enters first time into physics. This is the point. Okay. And now that geometry has entered uh, the description of uh, physics. Uh, and time, uh, we come to the next big step. The next big step was in, started in, in, in 1905 and ended in 1915 uh, and this is the uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, you don't, don't have to read everything there but just listen to me. We looked at Newton's laws, right? Two masses which were instantaneously uh, interacting with each other, right? I mean, I move this, immediately this will move. And uh, you don't know what is causing this uh, interaction, right? Now, if this is so, then it is in conflict with the special theory of relativity because nothing can be instantaneous. Every disturbance can maximally travel with the speed of light. Like you take two charged particles, you know, like we are looking at each other, there are charged particles in our eyes and your eyes, which are interacting actually, but there is a time delay because light comes from your eye to mine. This, this point was realized by Einstein actually, that there was a big flaw in Newton's theory of gravity. So this is a very big, uh, very big revolution. And uh, you should read about, you know, uh, it is very inspiring to read about the history of general relativity because we all think, oh, Einstein was a great genius, you know, suddenly every, all these great geniuses produce all these great physics. But it's a, it's a very, a very sort of encouraging story that, you know, ordinary people can also do important work. Because, I'll tell you, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a little bit more time than you have ask me to please. Uh, so, in 1915 the Berlin Academy invited Albert Einstein to give lectures on general theory of relativity. The first day the equation he presented was wrong. Now I don't want to tell you why it is wrong. Today even a graduate student in mathematics knows why it was wrong but uh, Einstein didn't realize that. It is only in the third lecture, in the third week, 
in the lecture of the Berlin Academy that Einstein arrived at the right equations. So there's so much struggle, and this this is going on from 1905. This struggle to invent a formalism to understand the theory of gravitation, and he hit upon the idea that this formalism has to happen in terms of uh, the geometrization of space and time. And I, I'll just uh, just read out a few things that the force of gravity acts instantaneously is not consistent with special relativity. I said that already. Einstein would like to have the force of gravity communicated at the speed of light by a field analogous to the electromagnetic field. But what is that field? That is the main point. What was that field? That field was the metric of space-time. So here is a little picture actually which I, I made. This, all these uh, animations are from my friend Juan Maldasena actually, who is very good in doing all this. Uh, so general relativity, long story short, describes the changes of geometry of space-time caused by massive objects to which other objects respond. Now what does that mean? It means I look at this, suppose this is a sun, so it's a very massive heavy object, okay? And imagine space-time is a grid, you know, like a tarpaulin type of thing, you put some heavy object, it sinks, right? <coughs> now if you put some smaller object there, like, a, you know, maybe a tennis ball or something, it'll just fall to it, right? But this fall can be understood in terms of falling into the shape created by this massive object. Okay? So this is the geometrization of gravity. So in curved space-time, an object follows a path that maximizes the proper time. And this, this is some mathematical stuff. You don't have to worry about it. But this is just a little animation. So this is the central idea of the general theory of relativity that uh, it that objects you know distort space time it's like a grid which is like an elastic grid and it's distorted actually and other objects uh, sort of uh, respond to that distortion but you might be wondering actually why we haven't observed all this in spite of the fact that we have a big star called the sun we have seen it in a very uh, indirect way by the fact that the sun bends light Okay, but if I shake heavy objects, you don't you don't see gravitational waves. Now the reason is the following: for reasons I don't want to detail, this space-time grid is communicative and causal, but it's very 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 stiff. It is ten to the twenty times stiffer than steel. But what shakes it up if two black holes collide? then this jiggles and we observed those jiggles in 2015 in the LIGO experiment on gravitational waves because this grid is so stiff that it required us to measure a tiny effect coming from a billion years away of such a cataclysmic collision of two huge black holes actually okay so this is the uh, sort of the essential aspect of the general theory of relativity now now I'll tell you something about, it has practical consequences also, which I will explain to you right now, and you'll be all very delighted to hear this, that uh, according to the general theory of relativity, time flows more slowly near massive objects. Means if I go very far from the Earth, my time will be faster. Now don't ask me uh, the equations for this, they are there on the next slide, but uh, so this is a prediction of the general theory of relativity that a watch will go faster if you go away from a gravitating object. And this, <coughs> this is another cartoon sort of telling you the same thing that uh, if, if I am observing time over here in my watch and I go very near the surface of a huge star, time will start slowing down. Okay? And it will actually stop <coughs> if the star is a black hole. This is a curiosity slide. Now, I don't explain to you why and all that, but that's what a black hole is, where time stops at some point. Okay. Now, <coughs> sorry. Yes. Yes, where is the GPS? 
Ah, thank you. So what is all this used for? You see, all of you are carrying cell phones and all the time you are using Google Maps, no? Now, this Google Map is corrected for this time difference due to the satellite. The satellite is a geocentric satellite, no? It's very far from the Earth, right? So the time there, the timekeeping there is different from here. And also the satellite is moving very fast. So you have to take into account special relativity and the general theory of relativity to arrive at your Google Maps being so accurate. I mean, this is amazing actually. But so actually all of you are beneficiaries of the <laughs> theory of relativity also. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to make this point. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, last uh, penultimate slide. Okay. <laughs> So, I told you a lot about the history of us as a species trying to discover almost periodic motions in the world around us to be good timekeepers, right? We had a, a story about that. Now, fine, so you're looking for regularities in the natural world to, uh, to, 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 to synchronize our lives, time, etc, etc. So all that we said. However, however, uh, most phenomena in the real world exhibit a fundamental irreversibility. All engineers know that. And it was, in a, it was uh, Carnot, a very famous uh, French engineer, that uh, that uh, gave us the so-called laws of thermodynamics, which are empirical laws, uh, which encapsulate this idea of irreversibility. I don't want to explain all that to you, but those of you who are biologists in this uh, audience uh, will know about these type of things, that, uh, uh, that uh, the chicken doesn't go back into the egg, right? <laughs> in a more, more, simple, uh, more simple example is uh, take a piece of wood, okay? And, uh, you know, a piece of wood is a certain state of its atoms, molecules, uh, all held together in a very complicated way. You set fire to it, at the end of it there is ash, and some carbon dioxide went out, some water vapor went out, some nitrous oxide went out, some, some whatever, depends on the composition, right? So that's the final state. Now you ask yourself, why, <coughs> why does... Uh, the time reversed of this doesn't happen. You take a movie of this and then you can reverse the movie, right? Why doesn't it happen in nature? And I think uh, this is a fundamental fact of nature actually, which, uh, which we say is explained in terms of the laws of thermodynamics, but nobody proved the laws of thermodynamics uh, and, and, and tell you why there is a problem. The problem is that there is irreversibility. But all the laws I wrote down in the beginning of this talk, for all time, reversal symmetric means uh, take those laws, then they are invariant and uh, time going to minus itself. So how come from our understanding of the laws of nature, which are time reversal invariant, you get thermodynamics? Why? So this is a very important question. It's, uh, it's the beginning of a, uh, the beginnings of this. Uh, the, the the quantitative study of this question was laid by Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, <coughs> who introduced the, the formula for entropy of a gas as a measure of the number of internal states that make up the system, and showed under reasonable hypotheses. So what hypothesis is important? about the randomness of the collisions, that the entropy always increases in time. So in some sense, we are trying to understand why the chicken doesn't really go back into the egg in terms of simple systems. And I don't think uh, we have been able to really, in very general terms, prove this uh, even today. <coughs> so Boltzmann then laid the foundations of statistical physics. And subsequently, his ideas were adopted by Claude Shannon in 1948, when he was at the Institute in Princeton, of a discrete version of Boltzmann's formula that forms the foundation of information and communication theory today. 
So here is my last slide about the journey of time. So what is this? This is a cartoon of our universe, okay? So this is it. I mean, um, so there is something called the Big Bang here, which, is, which are two words for things we have no idea about. We have no idea about it because we don't know what it means to talk of time, space, anything. But there is a notional uh, idea of a Big Bang which you arrive at for some theorems of uh, Hawking and Penrose in general relativity. And let's assume that there was a Big Bang, okay? And in fact, uh, <coughs> one of the favorite ideas these days is there are many, many Big Bangs, but of different types. <coughs> So this is something like 10 to the minus uh, 36 seconds. And then as time flows, the universe of course here is very, very hot and it progresses. So it progresses, matter happens, dark matter happens, galaxies are formed, uh, stars are formed and this is, a, this is the progression of time for a period of uh, approximately 13.8 uh, billion years. And the universe really has to cool down enormously for us to be around because complex systems cannot arise in a very, very hot environment. And I just thought that uh, this is the last slide uh, to tell you that uh, it is in terms of the concept of time and corresponding concepts of uh, temperature and expansion of the space that we uh, are able to sort of even have some cognizance of uh, what our universe is. And just one thing I'll want to tell you, which is uh, quite, uh, you must be wondering, why is our universe so big? This is a very fundamental question, actually. Why is it so big? Now, something very amazing happened after the Big Bang, uh, that the universe expanded exponentially fast in 10 to the minus 29 seconds to a huge object. We don't understand why. We, we can write a mathematical model which says that something is possible like this. But the universe became large. Once it became large, there was the production of matter, quarks, nucleus, etc., etc., the stuff that makes us, the stars, etc., etc. So this is, this is ultimately the journey of time. Each step is very complicated. Many, many different sciences actually are involved in understanding each step. Our knowledge of the universe, visible knowledge, comes only after here. So this, this, this is something like 300, 000, three to 400,000 years after the Big Bang, where matter actually became electrically neutral. Yeah. That plasma became neutral. And once it's neutral, uh, <coughs> uh, there is no screening. So the photons that left at that time left an imprint of this surface and these photons were observed. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was very hot, as hot as the temperature of the surface of the sun here at this time. But today it is something like 2.73 degrees Kelvin only. We live in a very cold universe, an expanding universe. And because we live in a cold universe, we are all around over here. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. All right, I hope uh, I was able to say a few. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, what I'm very happy about is that nobody has asked any philosophical question about time. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then I would have, I would actually request other people to answer. <laughs> yes, Gurmeet. Huh? Yes. We think that. Your thoughts on yes, I mentioned yeah. about on the arrow of time has yeah. to do with what Boltzmann tried Entropy, to prove. Right? Yeah. Yes, so 
the, it means the following basically that uh, if you have a complicated complex system a system which is sort of not decomposable into simple motions then uh, for such systems we can define a measure we quantify everything we quantify and measure a notion of entropy actually okay so this idea was introduced by Boltzmann and he introduced this so called h function which is a function of time as a certain formula and he showed that under certain hypotheses that the for a gas for example that the collision is random okay he showed that that object always decreases so he established a certain arrow of time by that formula actually and of course I mean uh, a gas is a very simple object but now a chicken and egg and all that is much more complicated but we see that it also true there we can't prove those things but uh, this is the idea of the arrow of time that the entropy always increases but but now many people are saying that you could actually uh, have the arrow going the other way as well and maybe travel right? what are your thoughts on no I mean uh, time I, 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 I don't think so I mean I think the point is that our laws of nature are time reversal invariant mm -hmm. but uh, for example the laws of uh, take a gas in this room okay so there are molecules here. Let's not worry about the structure of the molecule. So these are just hard objects just uh, interacting, right? Mm -hmm. Now each of these molecules is following Newton's law. Mm -hmm. Newton's law of motion is invariant under if I put if I put t going to minus t, uh, that law is invariant. And for simple uh, motions, for example, if you throw a ball up, right, and you take a movie of it and you reverse it, you will find that happening in nature also. Yeah. But take a gas and take a movie of all these objects interacting with each other that movie cannot be reversed is an experimental fact and Boltzmann tried to give a quantitative uh, understanding of it I don't think there is anything about going backward and all that business so, so that's fiction I, I don't think so <laughs> sure yes in the stock market yes <laughs> Maybe you could make I don't run. know I didn't know this right. I only knew that uh, the uh, the all the defense labs of the United States uh, and the president's office of the United States something I read recently uh, are basically plugged into this time standard at these huge laboratories actually so that's all I know but it must play a very important role in a lot of electronic devices in computing devices everywhere no, I think the reason why it's becoming more and more important yes. in the stock market yes. is because of all this algorithmic trading. So there are, you know, there are competing trades going on, and you need to know, you know who actually was did it first. first. Ah. Right. So, so you you need to be very accurate. Be accurate, but maybe not this accurate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it's it's interesting that Claude Shannon. Yes. For example, understood yes. this business of how to play the stock market by playing time. I see. And he was very successful. He was one of the most successful. He really broke the stock, the stock market in some sense. I see. And he spent all this money on antique cars. I see. At MIT, he stopped doing research, <laughs> right? Basically, he was playing around, juggling. <laughs> and uh, buying antique cars I see. and winning at the stock market. I see. Okay, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I see. Thank you.
thank you sir for that very illuminating talk i enjoyed it and i'm sure all of us did as well now we go on to the presentation of uh, p uh, certificates for our doctoral program graduates and msca graduates uh, i request uh, her highness pramoda devi to please come on stage and present our doctoral program graduates with their certificates Dr. Nutan Shamnaba, her thesis titled "A Study of Ayurvedic Pharmacoepidemiology and Therapeutics of Madhumeha, Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus: An Untapped Potential for New Drug Discovery." Dr. Shri Shri Vidya Kalyana Sundaram, her thesis titled "The Porous Self: Crafting an Intrinsic Ecological Consciousness Through Text, Image, and Movement." <laughs> Dr. Savita Dattatri Nadig, her thesis titled. understanding the specific molecular mechanisms that govern rna mediated signaling in staphylococcus aureus <laughs> dr pavana thomas her thesis titled role of rhoc in regulation of stemness in cervical carcinoma Uh, thank you your highness uh, you may please take your seat i now request professor spenta wadia to please come back and uh, give our doctoral program graduates their certificates as well thank you sir dr sarayu ramakrishna her thesis titled apoe4 effects basal and nmda are mediated protein synthesis in neurons by perturbing calcium homeostasis um dr mohak sharda who couldn't be here today dr hari krishnan nb his thesis investigations into learning algorithms in intelligent machines uh we also have a masters by research graduate with us here today i request sir to award ms harshini baba surendran her dissertation topic was investigating the role of human pluripotent stem cell derived lung epithelial cells in pulmonary fibrosis uh thank you sir you may please have your seat a few of our doctoral program graduates could not be here today we still would like to announce them and celebrate their success dr shri dr shreya parthada sharma dr neha vijay kalmanka and uh, dr bhavika mam and dr surya shankar sen a few of our msca graduates also couldn't be here uh, ms annapurna prabhu ms bhavya v and mr zishan a mirza v thank you all it is as important to celebrate the extracurricular activities and victories just like academic success we do that now by awarding the prizes to the winners and runners up of various sports activities held during the annual sports week last year i now hand over to ms pallavi for announcing the names and winners names of the winners and runners up thank you
Before starting the prize distribution, I would like to mention the tremendous participation and enthusiasm shown by the staff and students of IAM and TDU in various sports events conducted during the annual sports event 2022. I invite Mr. Navas, business magnet and philanthropist and World Trade Organization analyst onto the stage to give away the prizes. Shuttle Badminton, women's category. Runners up, Mrs. Triveni and Mrs. Annapurna. Winners, Dr. Sahana and Mrs. Sri Vidya Venkatesh. Shuttle Badminton, Men's Category. Runners up, Mr. Venkatesh and Mr. Rajesh. <laughs> Winners, Mr. Prasanna Simha and Mr. Armandeep. Quite women's category. Runners up Mrs. Anita and Mrs. Sri Vidya Venkatesh. <laughs> Winners Dr. Sahana and Mrs. Annapurna. Tenicoid men's category. Runners up Mr. Ajit and Mr. Purna Chandra. Winners Mr. Mahendra and Mr. Jijikal. I request Dr. Mr. Basavraj to collect the prizes on their behalf. Sorry. Thank you, sir. You may please have your seat. Thank you so much. Now I request Mr. P. N. Ganesh, Inspector of Police, to come onto the stage. He is the only person from Karnataka who conquered Mount Everest in, with 193 national flags hoisted there and carried the holy books Bhagavad Gita, Bible and Quran. <laughs> Lemon and Spoon, Women's Category. Runner up Mrs. Annapurna. Winner Mrs. Geeta. Lemon and Spoon, Men's Category, Runner, Mr. Prishpendra Jat. <laughs> Winner, Mrs. 
winner mr naresh i request everybody to cheer up for the winners fast walking women's category runner miss sabanita uh, the student is not here so i request mrs shalini to collect the prize on her behalf winner dr batul divan fast walking men's category runner up mr vishwasi and winner mr mahendra the students are not present here so i request mr basavraj to collect the prizes on their behalf thank you sir you may please have your seat now i request mr shivaramu former chairman karnataka bar council to come on to the stage to give away the prizes the following were the runners up for throw ball dr sahana dr purnima mrs shweta mrs rashmi ms swati ms archana ms mandodara ms jini and ms sara please give them a loud round of applause first prize for throw ball was backed by mrs amrita mrs anita mrs manjula mrs madhavi mrs namita mrs manasa mrs asmita mrs sabrina mrs sri vidya venkatesh and mrs sri vidya vats chess runner up is mr pushpendra jat winner dr sanket he is not present here so i request mr pushpendra to to collect the prize on his behalf karam runner up mr pushpendra jat and ms madhushri <laughs> winner mr rajesh and mr anil
Thank you, sir. You may please have your seat. May I request Captain Rajesh Jai Simha, Chief Vigilance Officer, Social Welfare Department, Bangalore, to give away the prizes. <laughs> Table tennis, women's category, runner up, Mrs. Sri Vidya Vatsal. Winner, Mrs. Anita. Table tennis, men's category. Runner-up, Mr. Prasanna Simha. Winner is Dr. Sanket. He is not present here. So I request Mr. Prasanna to collect the prize on his behalf. The following were the runner-up for volleyball. Mr. Venkatesh, Mr. Ranjit, Mr. Naresh, Dr. Kumar, Dr. Girish, Mr. Manjunatha and Mr. Manoj. First prize for volleyball was bagged by Mr. Ajit, Mr. Mahendra, Mr. Purna Chandra, Mr. Jijikal, Mr. Little, Mr. Prafula, and Mr. Sanjaya. I request Ms. Basav Mr. Basavraj to collect on their behalf. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Please have your seat. Now I request Vinay Kumar IPS, former DGP of Uttarakhand, onto the stage to distribute the prices. Sorry. I request our Vice Chancellor, Sri Darshan Shankar, to come onto the stage to give the prices. This is a rolling trophy for the winners of throwball and volleyball. I request the winners of throwball to come onto the stage. Please give them a loud round of applause. I request Dr. Girish to come onto the stage to receive the rolling trophy for volleyball. Thank you, sir. Congratulations to all the winners. Now I invite Mr. Atul Kumar Gupta to render the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I take it as my privilege and honor to propose a vote of thanks at the conclusion of this great day today, which we have observed as a library day. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Her Highness Pramoda Devi Vadya Ji from Royal Family of Mysore for gracing us with your presence on the special occasion of the Indian Medical Heritage Day. Her Highness, your presence has made this event 
all the more special and memorable for us. We are extremely grateful to Her Highness for recognizing the importance of libraries and their contribution to the society. Your support, Her Highness, and encouragement have been instrumental in promoting reading culture and knowledge sharing amongst the people, especially in this university when we have large number of students, faculty, so on and so on. The library established under Her Highness Your Patronage has been a valuable resource for students, researchers and book lovers. They have provided access to a wide range of books and resources, thus enriching the lives of many. I would also like to take this privilege and honor to express thanks and deep gratitude to Dr. Spenta Arwadia, Founding Director and Infosys, Homi Baba Chair Professor, ICTS TIFR Bangalore, for sparing his valuable time to be with us, sharing his valuable thoughts on the journey of time. Thanks, sir, for your outstanding talk describing the history of the concept of time and the measurement in simple terms and how the physical sciences and in particular the theories of electricity and magnetism and gravitation have brought about profound conceptual changes in our ideas of time and space and to add one more line to this personally for me it has been a eye opener the time which we do not honor most of the time, but I have understood today that how time has evolved with so much of trial and tribulations. And I think it's a big lesson for all of us that we should respect the time. And going by your dictum, sir, today, we are finishing our program well ahead of time. So we have honored that. <laughs> we are fortunate to have a leader like our visionary Vice Chancellor, Professor Darshan Shankarji, who recognizes the importance of knowledge and education. I express my gratefulness to you, sir, for your constant inspiration and guidance. And we keep looking onwards for your continuous guidance, sir. I take this privilege to all the distinguished guests and special guest we have amongst us, Mr. Arvind Singh, Commandant, CISF Bangalore International Airport, Maksud Muhammad Ali, Lucky Ali Music Composer, Mr. Ricky Kaj, Indian Music Composer, Grammy Award, Mr. Nawaj, Business Magnet, Philanthropist, WTO Analyst, Captain Rajesh Jaisima, Chief Vigilance Officer, Social Welfare Department, Mr. H. C. Shidivasam, former Chairman, Karnataka Bar, Inspector of Police, and who has the honor of climbing the Mount Everest. I take this privilege to all thank all other distinguished guests present here who have spared their valuable time to grace this occasion, either uh, presence of all of you has indeed provided us immense encouragement and we look forward to your incessant support in days to come as well. I would also like to put on record the assistance and cooperation provided by all the faculties, students, doctors from IAM and staff of both TDU and IAM uh, including the, our service groups members who have been constantly working behind the scene to make this occasion a very encouraging one and successful one, both at TDU and IM, without which we all know the observance of this day would not have been possible. At the end, I would like to express my deep gratitude and appreciation to the hard work put on by each one of my colleagues here who have been toiling hard for last few days so to ensure that we are well in time and quality of our expression and observance. With this, I thank everybody once again and close my speech. Thank you.
Thank you, Atul sir, and thank you, Pallavi, for announcing the winners and runners up earlier. We now conclude today's program with the national anthem. I request all of you to please stand. Jai 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 